Um, now, what I'll do is I've requested Santi, my colleague, uh, who has prepared a very nice PowerPoint uh, to bring the key messages in three slides. What uh, are the points that you should look for in the case study that we shared? So this film, just to give you a preamble, it is not an advertisement film. It is a real film uh, made by uh, a TV crew who watched what was happening in Dumaguete to kind of share a success story. It's like seeing is believing. So all the stories that you listen to in that, they are not acted on, they are actual real narrations, but they just put it together so that you can watch it in seven minutes rather than you know, having to listen to a, a, a very long lecture or a case study. So it is also put together in a way that it's persuasive. Now we saw many actors in it, so which we'll go through in a moment. Uh, so let me now uh, request my colleague Santi to share screen and go over the key messages in the case study. Santi, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sitaram. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Staram and Aski, for the opportunity. Good evening, everyone. My name is Santi, Associate in Asian Development Bank Institute. And it's my pleasure to take part in Dr. Sitaram's uh, session and to add more information about Dumagete case study. So now uh, that everyone haven't seen the video that Josna has kindly said in advance, so let us start with the context and background of this case study first. Yeah, so uh, as you saw in the video, the Magete city is located in central Philippines and its population is approximately 130,000 people. Around 2004, the bay fronting the downtown area was experiencing a very degraded environmental health due to the unregulated discharge of sewerage and septage. Therefore, the local city government of Dumagete initiated a city septage management program and was fully operational in 2010. The program provides citywide fecal sludge management service for desludging most septic tanks on a five-year rotating schedule. So it includes a fecal sludge treatment plan as well as a fleet of seven desludging trucks. So if you see figure one, uh, this is the Dumagete septage treatment Oh, sorry, Dumagete septic treatment plan. And uh, this is also contains the stabilization ponds, constructed wetlands, and sun drying beds. So uh, the program itself was implemented in parallel with other sanitation improvements, including a properly functioning on site wastewater system for the public market. And then eight years after the sanitation improvement were commissioned, the nuisance is now reduced and thousands of people use the waterfront park every day. This is close to the center of the septage wastewater treatment itself. And the business revenue, for example, from restaurants and hotels near the bay have increased as well as the property values and tax refer uh, revenues. And uh, also one of the most important thing is the bay is now an important tourism draw resulting in more meals served at the local restaurant and then rooms rented at local hotels. So we can see a very significant improvement between and after the fecal sludge treatment program itself. And now uh, let us talk uh, deeply more about, so how is the fecal sludge management program or FSM in Dumagete City? So this Dumagete City utilizes a bottom-up stakeholder-driven planning process to implement the FSM program. So when the septage treatment system was it in final stage of construction, the city uh, partnership with the local water uh, utility, namely Dumagete City Water District, this is a government-owned and controlled corporation. And they join operate the city septage management system. Under this arrangement, the city is responsible for the operation and maintenance of the treatment plan, while city water districts operate and manage the collection and transport of the septage 
to the treatment plan. And the treatment plan used waste stabilization pond technology and was designed with an operational capacity of 85 of cubic meters of septage per day. So if you see figure two, it shows the non-mechanized system of the treatment plan, which is require a very large, uh, approximately two hectares site. So it was initially a challenge of the local government because the only suitable site large enough was a village near the banks of the Okoi River. So initially, this is the possibility of future flooding risk and potential odor and health, uh, and also the health risk of the proposed treatment plan. And this is used by the local villagers to object the location. And also this is the cause of the delay of the progress of the program. So therefore, at that time, a river bank analysis and design of food contro flood control structures were conducted and incorporated in the program. Also very interesting that many doctors also spoke to the villagers about the health aspect of the program. And this is very helpful to change the mindset and attitudes of the villager itself. And also another crucial aspect of this program is about the tariff. So tariffs or fee are collected to cover the cost of the services including the full cost recovery of the capital expenditures or cha uh, CAPEX and operational cost OPEX. And the city water district itself, they administer the billing for the septage program and adding the fee to the user's water bills. And uh, so other than improving the tourism attraction in the city area, there have been other economic spillover effect as well as that have been realized in the city as a result of their SM, FSM program. So when the treatment plan was installed, uh, uh, as the incentives to the host community, the local government improved the roads and then they also built a health center and create a scholarship fund event, very interesting, and provided uh, local employment opportunities at the fecal sludge treatment plan. So, Property values in the areas surrounding the treatment plan have since increased significantly and turning into an upscale residential neighborhood. And to estimate this FSM project's economic spillover effects on local economic performance, city-level data are used in the analysis where the parameter of annual regular income is the indicator of local GDP and the real property tax is an indicator of property value, which is provided by the Bureau of Local Government Finance. And in this way, uh, the net present value or NPV of the spillover effects on local economic development and property values can be examined. And uh, in the table one, the estimation result of the spillover values and NPV are uh, prepared and created by our uh, former ADBI colleague. And we can see that there is a large increase in GDP growth and property tax value from 2013. This is compared to the milk growth in 2010 until 2012. So to recall again, this FSM progress program was fully operational in 2010. So th uh, this is shows that there is a three-year lag period of the SM, FFSM project to have tremendous economic spillover effects. While on the other hand, by estimating the NPV and comparing it to the project initial, initial cost, the whole period NPV of GDP spillover effects is very high, is, is it around four times higher than the initial cost. And also uh, the whole period NPV itself of the property tax spillover value, this is uh, around 22% of the initial cost. So again, therefore, all of this estimation suggests that the M FSM project in the Dumagete city has been positively affecting local economic development and capital values, which give additional evidence of the benefit of infrastructure investment in Dumagete City. So now, like what Dr. Sitara mentioned before, how can we learn from this case study? 
So actually, many things can be learned from the Duma Getty case study, but we would like to highlight a few points. First is about financial model and business plan. This is pr uh, proven from this case study as a turning point in the early phase of the program. So it was based on the concept that if everyone paid a little for the tariff, there would be enough money to support the program. And then making monthly payments of the top water bill instead of having to pay a lump sum at that time of service was perceived as being more affordable for the society at that time. And then second, it's about the promotional initiative. So this program initially started out to introduce a scheduled desalaging program. At that time, participation was voluntary. But since families were paying for the service through their monthly water bills, the percentage of participating families was initially high. So this is, it is believed that the promotion campaign drove this initial success of the uh, FSM program initially in the Dumagete city. And the third uh, point that we would like to highlight is about partnership. So as you've seen in the, uh, in the video and from my earlier explanation, we can imagine that numerous, uh, numerous local government units, as long as the private groups and also international development agencies have visited the city's septage system and also uh, involved in the development of this program. And this is also can be one of the inspiration and encourage uh, to other countries and can be a model to other local government units from different countries as well. And finally, the spillover effects. So uh, by the part of the implementation of the F SM program, uh, it's resulted in a real economic development that has had a significant and very substantial impact on the city. So we can highlight again the spillover offer if, uh, effect from this uh, program, for example, like the increased property values, availability of job for residents, and then the power supply, roads, and also the public village healthcare, even school and college education assistance. So those are the lessons learned that we would like to highlight from this Dumagete City case study. And now we are moving to the discussion. On this part, I would like to hand over again to Dr. Sitaram. Thank you very much. A yeah, big applause to Santi. Um, she not only presented, uh, secondly, she also uh, prepared excellent slides. So uh, we will share these slides so that you can use them also for your sharing. This case study is not to tell you something, it's also for you to use to share with your colleagues. That's why we made the film and the slides we prepared this time so that it can be uh, learning materials and also discussion materials. The project is not a project that was funded by the Asian Development Bank at all. As you have learned during the explanation from Santi, it was a kind of a self-help initiative and it is fully financed, full cost recovery, so these are the important learnings and inspirational achievements of this. And I have checked this even during the COVID times. It was very interesting. Dumagete had much fewer infections during the peak times of COVID because they had a very good successfully operating sanitation system and also very good community participation. So there was a lot of uh, positive impacts even during the difficult times which they reported. So all these are not only just an example, how can we replicate that? So that is the first question that I would like you also to go through rather than saying, wow, that's nice. Let's find out their case was no different from many of these uh, small towns, municipalities, you know, 100,000 population. It's not too small, not too big. Similarly, what is it that they did which we have or we don't have at our respective places? And through this course, I hope, because this is kind of the early times in the course, I hope you will actually ask these questions and really pick up the learning. It was not an immediate success for them. It was a checkered path. They need to 
do many things. In fact, the person who spoke on the video, the mayor, was not the mayor who initiated the project. He's actually from the opposition party, the person who spoke on the video. So even across political terms, they owned up this project. This is fascinating. So these are the kind of things that we should look for and uh, pick up. How is it that we can structure the initiative in your respective municipalities, taking into account the limitations and taking into account the enabling factors. We need both. The limitations we can learn from others. So I've shared a compelling good example. When you have some enabling factors, how can you stretch it so that they don't become vulnerable? Good times are fine, but to prepare for difficult times is more challenging, also more important. So if you survive difficult times, it will be even more successful. So this project has all these learnings. The final explanation on the economic spillover is a very important, compelling point. What I'd like to impress on you through this case study, and we now have, have actually, Santi has written another theoretical paper to actually elaborate on this further, that improving water and sanitation is not like a goodie you do. It actually has much bigger impacts and it's more sustainable by properly improving water and sanitation, and more importantly, sanitation. So this course has all these uh, important elements as learning objectives for the entire course, but in this specific lecture, we want to bring this on you. So now we have put two specific questions for you to respond to, and I see my colleague, uh, co-director, Professor Chari is here, so he may moderate better. <laughs> and maybe have his own insights. Actually, he has written another paper, which is coming out in another book, which we have written up. What are the lessons we can draw for context in Asia and developing countries? So let me request uh, Chari to facilitate the discussion with the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sitaraman. Thank you, Shanti, for a fantastic uh, <clears throat> presentation. Uh, this case study, friends, is a very practical, real-life situation. This is confronting practically, you, this case study, you can relate to all the cities that you are coming from. What they have demonstrated is that investing in sanitation has led to local economic growth as well as public health improvement. And we started our program with these two terms. That was a theoretical conversation. This is a practical conversation. So what I would like to understand from each one of you or some of you, what can be done or what you think could be replicated in a, in your cities, in your town, because some of you are from Kathmandu, some of you are from, uh, you know, in uh, Bangladesh, many cities are coming from Bangladesh, Africa, and of course, a lot of cities from India. So let's assume Ashok Kumar, Jharkhand. So Ashok Kumar, sahab, ye ye, this uh, example can be, what are the aspects that you like and which can be replicated? What have they done? It's a simple thing. They organize themselves. Yes. And then they set up a good treatment system. They have a good business model. And of course, there's a good political leadership. And you may argue that we may not have political leadership, but I think uh, with your presence and participation, we have to build that political leadership. Yes. Ashok Kumar, sir, over to you. They said didn't uh, wait for uh, to get support from someone, some funding support or uh, some other from state or from uh, like in our center or state, there may be some government the government should take initiative uh, though uh, they didn't wait for that uh, they started uh, by itself that thing is very inspirational and and by uh, here we are uh, also providing the study of spillover effects and that study also uh, supports and motivates and will motivate uh, other districts to implement uh, and accept uh, easily uh, this FSA. 
very very nice i think you have said a very beautiful point uh, they didn't wait for central government or any other higher tier of government to initiate this simple local action i think you have raised a very very important point now sa hamid from bangladesh so uh, <clears throat> what do you think Mr. Ashok Kumar raised a very important point that they didn't wait for LGED or they didn't wait for PHE to support them, but local government has triggered this action, and it is not a super expensive option like laying a sewer system and waiting for big uh, you know investments from uh, loans. So, Mr. Amit, uh, uh, would you like to comment on this? Anyone else? It doesn't matter. Even Nikita Raj. I am. I am Mr. Hamid. Oh. This yeah, might Mr. be. Hamid. Yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead. Sir, I am. Uh, can I add something to it, sir? Yes, please go ahead. Continue. Uh, it's a uh, partnership between the uh, uh, municipality itself uh, or the consumers mm -hmm. itself yes, and between the service right. provider is quite commendable and uh, this can be actually uh, practiced uh, in case of Kathmandu as well and uh, since they since they did not uh, wait for uh, the uh, initiation from the central or the provincial or the local government itself and uh, especially the urgent uh, need of uh, uh, that uh, addressing uh, this uh, sanitation issues is quite um, is quite emergent and quite uh, need needed for the uh, local consumers as well so they can uh, themselves contribute or they can they, i think they would be eager and more than willing to contribute uh, some of the um, some uh, financially as well if such uh, projects or such ideas are uh, initiated and maybe uh, our uh, and if uh, maybe our department could coordinate uh, and uh, cap could capacitate uh, them as well so yeah i think you made a very excellent point again you know, that relationship between the local government and the water utility and also charging a small amount of money month after month not causing a immediate burden i think is a phenomenal thing yeah mr rahman over to you yeah uh, thank you uh, professor chari uh, uh, good uh, there is a good presentation uh, uh, about the dumugati city yeah the, uh, the presenter uh, express uh, uh, express the outcome very well uh, but i want to add something on that uh, like uh, the the last week we were um, making an uh, making a meeting regarding uh, the the private uh, private company actually private company uh, they wants to contribute to the government in making some some uh, solid waste management plant or figure sludge management plant. So uh, as the uh, the developing uh, countries uh, like they don't have enough enough fund to uh, construct this FSTP or laying out the several networks. So that time the private company can uh, can make some uh, uh, can make some um, investment with uh, the government as a public. Private partnership, so uh, there uh, the government can uh, can do that also. So this is uh, the addition of uh, for the uh, uh, um, for the com uh, for the uh, installment of the uh, um, and the pipeline and the uh, and the construction of the treatment plants. Uh, thank you. What to you, Professor? Sharin? No, Mr. Rahman, I think you raised a very interesting point. Uh, one is about the public-private partnership. But let's keep that aside. The other point you raised was that the private trading community, it could be hoteliers, it could be uh, restaurant owners, or it could yes. be uh, private, uh, you know, citizens who have some business, yes. who have some activity, tourism related, like Cox's Bazaar. There's a lot yeah, of yeah, hotels yeah. and yeah, tourism. Now, there is a very clear relationship that was shown by Shanti that investing in sanitation has actually helped tourism in fact dumagate is also on a you know it's a tourist destination it's a beautiful place so 
if we can convince them, if we can make a strong case, I think the concept of fund your city can also be triggered in, in such situations. So citizens and eminent, uh, you know, trading community can also fund a small infrastructure uh, programs. I think you've raised a very, very appropriate point, but this communication has to be completely taken on board, particularly by the political leadership. And this, uh, let me also tell you that this video is actually shared by uh, Dr. Sitaram. It is available on uh, YouTube and it's uh, for circulation. So feel free to share with your own partners and city mayors and others. It's a very, very compelling case to convince our own political and administrative machinery and in turn communicate to the, uh, you know, the eminent groups of the city so that they can become partners in the development. Yeah. Uh, Mr. De Silva. Um, so this is coming from a amateur kind of perspective since uh, I've only fairly recently uh, entered the uh, citywide uh, sanitation solutions and I'm coming from a communications background. But perception seems to be a big uh, component of this. And I think this has already been elaborated with the tariffs being added onto the water bill instead of being its own separate uh, cost. And we were talking about in our previous session with accountability and creating accountable systems, but that causes it to be, uh, it causes the community to view this as a high level problem. But when you change the perception, you kind of make it and not just show the challenges and in terms of the, the negatives, but see, show the positives in terms of cre uh, creating the property value, increase in property values, the tourism and the the cost by like the tariffs, it seems to be a much more better motivator in perception in getting things done in terms of politics. Sorry, that, that might be an amateur look, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, from a communication <laughs> standpoint, your position is absolutely right. Rather than being cynical, you're actually yeah. showing the positive aspect of uh, investing in sanitation and tourism and economic mm. development. I think that would also invoke what is called willingness to pay much mm. better than talking about, uh, you know, negative things if you don't do it. Rather show this Dumagato case, case study and yeah. say that this is what is the relationship and are you willing to pay? There'll be a greater willingness to pay mm -hmm. in such situations. And I'm sure uh, your, your point is absolutely right from a communication standpoint. And this has been right. the case in the water and sanitation, not only in sanitation. Thank you for raising this. Sure. Any other points? Uh, sir, we have a couple of poll questions shared by the DBI team. Okay. So, can we quickly shall we, run Shall those? we do that? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just launching the first poll. Yeah. So, in your opinion, what measures can be taken to encourage the adoption of FSM programs in other cities or regions? So, request the participants to respond quickly. Financial incentives for stakeholders or education campaigns and awareness programs or the government regulations and policies, collaborative partnership between public and private or others. You're please try to respond in the context of your own city or municipality. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we got 40% responses requesting others to kindly respond quickly. I'm displaying the answers. So uh, a large chunk uh, of people feels that uh, collaboration between public and private could be uh, a, a way forward. Uh, it's a big motivator for FSM programs to get replicated. Absolutely true. Thank you very much. And then the second one is about investing in uh, behavior change and awareness creation. So I think this is an interesting change. Uh, two, three years back, uh, if we were to run this poll, the response would have been predominantly on the, the first one, you know, the financial incentives, money, without that, we can't do anything. I think now there's a significant realization that public-private partnerships, engaging with citizens, engaging with uh, awareness creation uh, among the stakeholders would be uh, better, has a better payoff in terms of support for FSM program and citywide inclusive sanitation. Thank you. 
Next question. Sharing the second one. Yeah. Yeah. So, would you support the implementation of similar FSM programs in your own cities or region? Fifty percent responses. Okay, I'm ending at sixty-two. Yeah, if you are undecided yet, it'll be interesting to hear from people uh, who voted for undecided to get your views on uh, why do you think that. Uh, uh, there will be a limited support for FSM program in your city or region. What what was your motivation for, uh, I would say, for taking option three? I mean, it can be free flowing conversation. There's, you know, nobody is going to judge you for this. Anybody would like to comment? Seven of you. Some of you voted for undecided. Uh, in terms of uh, making a similar approach of what you saw, uh, what is the what is the reason for it? Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Thani from Cambodia. Yes, please. I uh, selected the uh, undecided because uh, uh, FSM is a bit new uh, in Cambodia because uh, some project have uh, failed for. Uh, this and uh, recently we just uh, start talking about uh, self eliminate sanitation but uh, it seems like uh, how to buy the government in is not uh, easy yet so uh, that is why I choose uh, and decide yeah, because this is uh, something new to Cambodia that we need to work more to buy the government in. I think uh, absolutely fair point so what you're saying is that we need to spend a little more time, understand, convince, start the process, and then that's why you have voted for undecided. Fair point. Anyone else quickly? Anyone else voted for undecided? Uh, Mr. Thani has made a very valid point because it's something new in Cambodia, and then uh, he needs a little more time to push the agenda, prime the whole uh, you know stakeholder groups, convince them, and then move forward. So we have one last poll question. So yeah, okay. Uh, we are okay. I'm launching it. Yeah. So the question is, how important do you believe FSM programs are for the overall development of a city or region? So it is extremely important, important or not very important. Fifty-seven percent responses. Okay, I'm sharing the answers. So only one person have told not very important. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, that's the uh, the view is that FSM programs are very important for uh, city development, both from quality of life, uh, local economic development, and also public health. So I think uh, this is a, a good example of how sanitation has triggered multiple benefits to the same city. Health improvement, quality of life, tourism, local economic development. I think that is one of the strong reasons why most of you have chosen uh, what you call uh, that investing in FSM is very, very important. Uh, are we clear about uh, from the case study there's a term that they have used called uh, scheduled desludging. Shanti has used this word, scheduled desludging. Uh, are we clear about? It? Because it's very important that we understand some of these uh, approaches. Any, any, anybody would like to comment on it? Anybody from FANSA? Anybody from uh, any of your, anyone of you? Doesn't matter. What do we mean by? Scheduled is sludging. Uh, I, I think uh, it's not no, but I think uh, 10 to 15 years ago in my city, and even in the neighborhood, uh, some people manually uh, 
remove the sludge from the houses. Uh, so I think that's, this may be. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Nasir, I think you raised another important point. So what you are saying is about mechanical versus manual desludging, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the scheduled desludging is very important. We will discuss this much later. But since the conversation started, it is a way, you know, the, the septic tanks or the pit latrines, they require a periodic uh, emptying to ensure the integrity of treatment and also to ensure that the treatment quality is sufficiently uh, realized. Because it is like, uh, you know, uh, what you call cleaning of our overhead tanks for water. We, keep, we store water uh, at the top and we need to clean it once in three months, six months, you know, we need to clean it, keep to keep it clean. Likewise, the septic tank, the sludge has to be evacuated periodically. Typically in Dumagate, it's once in three to five years. I think, Shanti, was it five years in Dumagate? It's five years. Five years. So that's a regulation. Now, what happens in a scheduled desludging regime is that the water utility, in fact, sends a truck and then desludges the facility every five years. And for that, they are charging a small monthly fee along with the water bill. So the citizen need not pay a lumpy investment when they send the truck. But the city authority, the water utility sends the truck, desludges, and for that, they charge a monthly or a quarterly fee. That's a scheduled desludge. Now, in a demand-based desludging, the private operators are called, like in most parts of our uh, country in Bangladesh and in India and many other places, the citizens respond when there is a backflow or when there is a chokage of the septic tank. And that time, the citizens call a number which is available locally and then they get it evacuated. And for that, citizens are paying. This is unscheduled and it is demand based. So in a scheduled system, the, the, the septic tank gets periodically desludged. And we will also hear from Japanese experience from Hashimoto-san how they do it on a year after year basis. It's a scheduled desludging, but once every year. So scheduled desludging is followed in many countries as part of the regulations, but some of our countries are moving, uh, moving towards more of demand-based desludging. Nothing wrong about it, but as long as we do it periodically as per the regulation, I think it is, uh, it, both the models can work. So that's a, that's a model Dumagate has followed, which is a very interesting model. We will discuss more about it. So, uh, Josna, am I encroaching into the time of uh, Hashimoto-san? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, I think we so should invite So, I think uh, this is a good start, a fantastic case study. I would like to thank uh, 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 Dr. Sitaram and uh, uh, Ms. Shanti for uh, introducing this case study and having this conversation. Now, I have the pleasure of inviting Hashimoto-san, who worked extensively in uh, what you call on-site sanitation systems in Japan at different levels as ADBI uh, expert, as government expert. And he's been advising India also on in some of our cities. We are also following, we're trying to implement regulatory framework of Japan. So on behalf of all of us, I would like to welcome and thank him for uh, taking out his time. And I request him to start the presentation. The presentation is about Japanese experience on sanitation improvement, particularly on-site sanitation. Over to you, Hashimoto. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Chari. So, uh, can you uh, upload my slide? Yes, yes, and I hope it is visible. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'll start. I am Kazushi Hashimoto, ADI consultant and advisor to Japan Sanitation Consortium. I will explain about the institutional framework for on-site wastewater management and septage management in Japan. Next, please. My presentation is divided into four chapters. Chapter one is on the key issues and challenges of on-site sanitation management system. Chapter two is on the regulatory framework for on-site wastewater and septage management 
in Japan and its achievements. Chapter three is on the organizational framework for citywide inclusive sanitation. And uh, chapter four is on the financial framework for citywide. Next, please. Chapter one, key issues and challenges. I'll present here uh, key issues and challenges of on-site sanitation management system often observed in developing countries. But some of them are not limited to developing countries. Next, please. Next, please. When I visited the ASCII four years ago, uh, Professor Cherry uh, gave me a book titled Policy on Fecal Surgery and Septic Management, published by Telangana State Government, which describes the issues and the challenges of on site sanitation management system in India, shown in this slide. You may, I believe that the situation in other developing countries are more or less similar to those in India. Next, please. We can categorize these challenges of on-site sanitation management system, which are commonly observed not only in developing countries, but also in developed countries, including Japan, as shown in this table. Whatever regulatory, organizational and the financial framework are to be chosen. All these challenges must be dealt with properly. Keyword would be to make on-site sanitation not a pub, pub, private matter, but a public matter. In Japan, on-site sanitation is very much a public matter. Next, please. I consider that the institutional framework consists of regulatory framework, organizational framework and the financial framework, which are closely interrelated. In this chapter, I will explain the regulatory framework in Japan, how it works and its achievements. Next, please. The left side, hand side of this table shows the challenge. The right hand side shows how Japan is responding to these challenges. The issue of improper design of on-site facility and the lack of monitoring of compliance with the building standard. For example, the problem of too small on-site facility compared to the number of users. In Japan, only the products which meet the structural standards established by the central government can be sold in the market. The new design of the on-site facility needs to pass the performance test conducted by the testing agency designated by the central government. In Japan, the design of the on-site facility is checked by the building officials deployed by the municipality government before the commencement of construction work of all the houses and the buildings. The problem of poor installation, such as on-site facility underneath homes, making access for inspecting or disrupting difficult, in Japan, only the installation business, which employs the certified installation workers who have passed national examination and the registered to the prefectural government, can do the installation works. Next, please. The problem of improper management of surge, such as dumping of fecal surge on drains and open areas and the problem of unregulated discharging operators working in difficult conditions. In Japan, this problem is dealt with both by making discharging a legal obligation of the owner of the on-site facility and by the approval system of the discharging vendors, in which only the discharging vendors, which are approved by the municipal government, can do the business. It is the legal obligation of all the municipalities in Japan to treat dispose of on-site surge safely. Nationwide development of surge treatment capacity under which more than 1,000 surge treatment plants were built by the municipal government nationwide in 1960s and the 70s, had contributed to solve these problems. Next, please. In Japan, we use Jokaso, high performance on site facility for both residential users and non residential, commercial, and institutional users. In developing countries, while most of the residential users con 
will continue to use septic tanks. Commercial, tank, commercial users are required to use a similar high performance on site facility like Jokaso. Such high performance on site facility requires operation maintenance services in addition to death running services in order to operate properly. In order to make such sure, make sure that such high performance on site facility operate properly, a lot of measures are taken in Japan. It is made a legal obligation of the owner of the on-site facility to maintain his or her on-site facility according to the frequencies established by the ordinance of the central government, which is every four months for small jokers or for household users, and every two weeks for the large jokers or for the institutional or commercial users. Only the operation maintenance vendor, which employs the certified operators and is registered to the prefectural government, can do the maintenance work. It is made a legal obligation of the owner to deploy a technical supervisor to manage large jokaso for uh, 501 pop population equivalent or more. On-site sanitation facility, regardless whether it uses conventional technology such as septic tanks or use, or use high performance on-site facilities such as Jokaso, a lot of human resources are required to build and maintain on-site facility properly. In Japan, the training and the national examination system for the installation workers, the surrounding workers, and the operator of such on-site facility was established. A training institution was founded and is designated as the agency which administers the national examination by the central government. Next, please. In many countries, not limited to the developing countries, the performance of the on site facility is not monitored. And uh, people who are dubious about the on site facility, resulting in the lack of accountability. In Japan, all the Jokaso, the standard on site facility in Japan, are subject to annual inspection by the third party inspection agency designated by the prefectural government. Furthermore, the compliance to the efficient standards of the large size on site facility is strictly monitored by the prefectural government in accordance with the uh, provision of water pollution control law. Next, please. This is my paper on the institutional framework on on-site sanitation management system in Japan passed by ADVI. For details, please uh, 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 read this paper. Next, please. I can list up four achievements of Japan's on-site wastewater and sanitation management system. Achievement number one may be Japan has succeeded to establish a, a complete fecal strategy management system 50 years ago. Next, please. Achievement number two is related to achievement number one. As a result of the establishment of a complete fecal strategy management system together with the piped water supply system, both of which were completed around the year 1970, Japan succeeded to eliminate waterborne diseases by year 1970. Based on this experience, I fully endorse Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's effort to improve fecal search management in developing country. It saves money, it saves life. Please, next please. Achievement number three may be Japan succeeded to develop human resources, which is vital for the on-site sanitation management. More than 200,000 technicians have been trained and have passed the national examination and joined the business related to the on-site sanitation and are making money. Next, please. Achievement number four may be the environmental effects 85% of all the on-site facility Jokaso in Japan produces the effluent of good water quality, BOD less than 
20 milligram per liter, which is equal to that of the modern wastewater treatment plants. Certainly, the Japan's on-site sanitation management system is contributing to the improvement of aquatic environment in Japan. Next, please. In chapter two, I explained how Japan's on-site wastewater and septage management system is working. You may understand that in Japan, while the central government establishes the regulation standards, local governments, uh, the municipal government and the, the prefectural government play important role in ensuring these regulations and standards are actually implemented and enforced so that the on-site scientist services are provided to all the customers properly. We can call it as municipality model. You may imagine that in order to make such system workable, a lot of human resources are needed in both public sector and the private sector. In this regard, you may find that in Japan, the training and national examination system administered by a training institution designated by the central government plays important role. Without such a system and training institutions, the municipality model would not work. But there's another option, which is the utility model. Recently, I visited a few African countries and found out that some African countries adopt the utility model for on-site sanitation management. Next, please. This table shows what are the differences between municipality model and the utility model. In many African countries, the same public utility, such as water and the sewage corporation, or water and the sanitation corporation, or sanitation corporation, which provides the sewage service, is also implementing the job related to on-site sanitation. The degree of their involvement in on-site sanitation differs country by country, but in almost all the African countries, at least treatment of sludge collected and transported by the desalting operators are conducted by such utilities. The regulation and the standards will be established by the central government. In many African countries, it is a common practice that an independent regulatory agency is created and this regulatory agency establishes the regulation and the standards and monitors the performance of utilities, including their compliance with the regulation and standards. The regulatory agency also has the authority to approve the tariff plan proposed by the utility from the viewpoint of balancing the interest of the customers and the utility. Next, please. The combination of Lusaka Water and Sanitation Company, LWSC, as a utility in charge of on-site sanitation system in Lusaka, Zambia, and the National Water Supply and Sanitation Council, NUASCO, as the independent of regulator is the typical case of the utility model. In Lusaka City, Zambia, 70% of the population lives in slum area, and most of them are using pit latrine. The search of these pit latrines, particularly those in the slum areas, had not been managed properly, resulting in the groundwater pollution and the recent spread of cholera disease in the city. In order to deal with these challenges, LWSC, the previous Lusaka Water and Sewage Corporation, renamed itself as the Lusaka Water and Sanitation Corporation and started to take a leading role for the improvement of on-site sanitation management, particularly in the slum area. As for the challenge of improper design of the on-site facility, in this case, the pit latrine, LWSC has developed the design of the improved pit latrine which does not contaminate the groundwater and easy to discharge. LWSC is promoting the use of the improved heat latrine by providing subsidies to the residents. Next, please. In order to deal with the challenge of improper sludge management, particularly in the slum areas, on-site sanitation and fecal sludge management, FSM services, were added at the scope of LWSC's operation 
and the Hegel Threat Management Unit was established in LWSC. LWSC has developed a FSM business model for provision of FSM service in the slum areas, under which LWSC has signed a performance-based contract with six private companies. LWSC subsidizes part of the impending cost. LWSC is operating the sewage system in the city, and one of their wastewater treatment plants received the on-site sludge. LWSC is building two new fecal sludge treatment plants. Next, please. In order to improve the accountability of the service of the water utilities in Zambia, National Water Supply and Sanitation Council, NUASCO, was established in 1997. NUASCO provides license to the utility which provides the water and sanitation service in the municipalities in Zambia and approves the tariff plan proposed by the utilities. NUASCO reviewed the license conditions for the utilities, utilities in uh, four, five years ago and added the service related to the on-site sanitation FSM to the utility's responsibilities. You may find that under the utility model, the existing utilities such as Water and Sewage Corporation expand their role to the area of on-site sanitation and the fecal sludge management and uh, taking lead for the improvement of on-site sanitation management system together with the regulatory agents in NUASCO in case of Zambia. Municipality model and the utility model, which model is better to follow? This may be an open question. There may be pro and cons of each model. Japan's organization framework for on-site sanitation is a municipality model, and uh, this model is working well in Japan. But, in developing countries, the utility model seems better fit to the reality in developing countries, particularly from the financial viewpoint, which I will explain in the next chapter. Next, please. Chapter four, financial framework for CYS. Next, please. When considering the financial option for CYS, particularly for FSM, the following three challenges, among others, must be taken into account. Challenge number one, high cost for desalinizing services. In Asia, it costs $50, and it is more expensive in Africa. It is a substantial financial burden for average household particularly if he needs to pay it uh, at once. Challenge number two, willingness to pay for the sanitation tends to be much lower compared to, the, uh, to that for the water supply service in developing countries. In South Asian countries, average household is paying six to eight dollars per month for water supply service, and two data per month for urban sewage services. On the other hand, in both Jakarta and Mania, which I, I made survey, the unit sewage service charge for the non residential users, such as uh, hotels co and commercial buildings, is set at a level of about five times higher than that for the residential user. In case of the sanitation service based on the sewage system, the cross subsidization is working to fill the gap between the high service costs and the low willingness to pay of the average household. But is such cross subsidization workable for the FSM services? Challenge number three, in some Asian countries, the utility operating the fecal sludge treatment plants, FSTP, charges the sludge treatment fee to the private distribution vendors. Such practice may induce the illegal disposal of sludge to the rivers and canals by private distribution vendors. 
The financial framework for CYS FSM needs to be the one which deals with the above three challenges effectively. There are three financial, uh, financial options. Next, please. This table shows the financial uh, framework for sanitation in Japan. The user of the sewage system pays the sewage charge to the utility together with the water bill. Each user of the on-site facility Jokasu in Japan pays the desalinizing fee to the private desalinizing vendor. Desalinizing fee is to be paid at once, which costs $200 in Japan. Sludge treatment cost is covered by the municipal general account. In other words, in Japan, the user of the on-site facility needs to pay the cost for removal and transport of the sludge but does not need to pay the sludge treatment cost. This is very important. In many Asian developing countries, sometimes the desalinizing vendors are charged the sludge treatment fee by the utility, which is passed on to the users. Uh, such practice may induce the illegal disposal of the sludge to the public water bodies, such as rivers and canals. Next, please. In some African countries, Sanitation surcharge system is introduced, in which all the customers of the water and sanitation utility, regardless whether he or she is connected to the sewer or not, pays certain percentage water bill and sanitation surcharge to the utility, which covers the cost income to the utility, inclusive of the on-site treatment cost. But I found that in most of African countries, the desalinizing cost is not covered by the sanitation surcharge. The on-site user needs to pay the desalinizing fee to the private desalinizing vendors separately from the sanitation surcharge to be paid to the utility. The sanitation surcharge is a useful financial measure to broaden the financial basis of the utilities. Since many water and sanitation corporations in Africa is doing not only sewage work, but also the work related to the on-site sanitation management, particularly the improvement of on-site facilities and the treatment of on-site sludge, such costs needs to be recovered by the sanitation surcharge. But the sanitation surcharge introduced in African countries is not enough to reduce the financial burden of the users of the on-site facility who needs to pay $50 or more to the private desalinizing vendors, which is sometimes too expensive for the average households. Next, please. The environmental charge introduced in Manila, the Philippines, has brought a breakthrough on this program. Next, please. In Manila, the Philippines, Water and the sanitation services are privatized, and the Manila Water is a concessionaire in the East Zone. Manila Water is responsible for provision of not only water supply and sewage services, but also FSM services in the service area. Consequently, Manila Water is providing FSM services by building ferrous carcerage treatment plants early on in parallel with building sewage systems, which is taking a long time. In order to recover the cost for FSM services, environmental charge was introduced. All the customers, regardless whether he or she is connected to the sewage system or not, inclusive of the commercial customers who are already co connected to the sewage system, need to pay environmental charge which is currently 25% of water charge. Sewage charge is charged to commercial and industrial customers who are connected to the sewage system, which is 32.85% of water charge. Thus, commercial and industrial customers connected to the sewage system needs to pay in total 55.85% of water charge. <laughs> Uh, 32.85 as sewage charge and 25% as environmental charge. Manual water is utilizing this revenue from these charges to cover the cost for the development of sewage system as well as for provision of efficient service for the residential customers who are not connected to the sewage system. 
Since the unit water charge for the commercial customers is set at five times higher than that for the residential customers, cross subsidization works in favor of the residential customers. In another words, if the residential customer pays the environment charge, which is 20% water charge, he or she is provided the surrounding service free of charge. Under this option, the user of the on-site facility doesn't need to pay the design charge at one, since it is included in the monthly water bill, which is already cross-subsidized. Such will reduce the financial burden on the average household users of the on-site facility greatly. This function may work the best under the utility model as the organizational framework in which the same utility does both water supply works, sewage works, and the fecal sludge management works. Same utility do all these jobs. Next, please. This is my conclusion. One, regulatory framework in Japan would be a useful reference for any country which wants to improve the water system since the issues and challenges to be dealt with are mostly the same in Japan and in any other countries. Number two, organizational framework and finance framework must be the one which copes with the challenges uh, which each country is facing and which reflects the unique situation of each country. Don't follow Japan. So I prepared two polls. Next, please. And Joshina, did you prepare uh, a poll? Yes, sir, I'm launching it. Oh, yes, please. Um, but the poll is visible? Uh, for me, no. Okay. Well, is not visible, Joseph. Oh, not uh, visible. Oh, oh. Just give me a second. Someone else is trying to launch. Yeah, it's okay. on. Yeah. So my question is, uh, which do you think is the most likely attitude of the common people toward the OM of on-site system? Uh, answer number one, people will take care of his or on-site system by his, him or herself. Once he or she is, is well informed of the importance of OM. As a two, people won't take care of his or her own such system and won't pay for the OM, even if somebody else is willing to do the job on his behalf. Number three, people won't take care of his or her own such system, but will pay for the OM if it is a legal obligation and somebody will do the work on his behalf. Please select. Please select one. We have received forty percent responses. Ashimoto san most of them chose option three. Oh, oh. I'm sharing the results. I see, I yeah. see. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I feel uh, uh, really at ease because I believe that Japan's institutional framework on such system based on our understanding of the people that toward OM, uh, OM, 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 OM system as answer three. Okay, the next four. Uh, uh, yeah, next page and next four. Yes, this is just a factual question. Uh, poll number two is on the organization flag for fecal search management of your municipality. My question is, which of organizational options does your municipality apply? Municipality option, uh, utility option, uh, or it has not been decided which option to apply to your municipality. Please select one. Yeah, so I'm sharing the responses. Yeah. Ah, I see, I see, I see. 
Okay, good. Okay. Does there anything else? No, sir. Don't yeah, you that's it. So, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. The I to to uh, questions from uh, audience. So, just now, if you can remove, yeah. So, uh, friends, <clears throat> I will take the opportunity to sort of uh, summarize to some extent. Uh, very important presentation made by Ashimoto Sam. It's very important to know that, as uh, Professor Ketawake mentioned, we all assume that Japan has only underground sewerage systems and STPs, treatment plants, and everything is sorted out. In fact, it's not true. He explained very clearly that Japan has gone through an evolution. Sanitation is an incremental improvement process. And even now, as Hashimoto-san presented, Japan has sewerage system substantially. However, they also have non-sewer sanitation options like most of our countries have. As Nasir Sab said, in his, in his city, in, uh, you know, in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in African countries, most of us are still dependent on on-site sanitation. And we have seen that even the dependence is there even in Japan. And that's what the presentation of Hashimoto-san is all about. But what they did is very, very important for us. What he presented was the challenges that all of us have and how Japan has addressed those challenges in a very comparative framework. And how did they address? Number one, they have, what is Jokaso? We used the word Jokaso. Jokaso is nothing but on-site sanitation in Japan. On-site sanitation in Japan is called Jokaso. Now this on-site sanitation is not a, just a technology, but it's a, also a regulatory framework. It is called Jokaso Act or Jokaso Regulation. So they have introduced a regulatory framework for managing on-site sanitation to reduce the disease burden. And he has shown a very beautiful graph. There is a very de significant decline in the disease burden, waterborne diseases, because of on-site sanitation, a combination of citywide sanitation approach. And he's convinced about it. And that's why this case study is all about. This experience is all about. Now, as a part of the Jokaso regulation, he spoke about some seven, eight points. I'm just recapping for our common understanding. Number one, first thing they did is to standardize the on-site system itself. Every on-site system, it is called a prefabricated on-site system or a scientifically designed on-site system. It's also called Jokaso technology in, in a common way is approved by the national government, the design specifications, testing standards, it goes through like a, a mobile phone goes through or a particular gadget goes through a testing process. It has to be certified and approved. So that, that way there is a assured treatment of on-site system happening. So the first thing is design of on-site system, performance test, it has to go through, then only they can sell and deploy and deploy in households or commercial establishments. Number one. Number two, he mentioned that the city government has to validate it. When a household gets a permit to establish, the city government officer, town planning person will visit building approval process. They will ensure that this has been properly established. One is a technology standardization and taking it to the ground and approval process by the town planning department at the building level. Third thing is only registered vendors are supposed to deploy the Jokaso systems. So there is a skill development process. Only those people should deploy it. Fourth, he mentioned about periodic desludging. The Jokaso system is a very advanced treatment system meeting all the BOD and COD standards of highest standard. However, there'll be sludge formation in the prefab system that has to be evacuated every year by the impaneled 
desludging operator by the municipality m panels and then those desludging operators have to be evacuated that is a fourth component of the regulation everything is regulated and standardized it is not left to individuals and the next point he mentioned was every 3 month every 4 months there is a oendm visit operation and maintenance inspection very important we can set up a treatment plan but it will fail to function if you don't have a good oendm systems so the oendm impaneled oendm agency will visit every 4 months to check whether the discharge whether the oendm is working well and whether the treatment plant is meeting the discharge norms how many times every once every four months for households and for commercial it's much more periodic and finally very important only trained personnel should be doing oendm only trained personnel will be installing it only trained personnel will be doing inspection and of course the pollution control board or a environment agency will do what is called a statutory inspection once a year so what it means is friends that on site systems are good provided they work well and to work well you need good governance you need good regulation and you need skill human capital and he mentioned so many people are trained 200000 people are trained so many good jobs are created because of a good regulation with regard to sanitation and he also discussed about different tariff models african model manila models so there are different ways of making it work utility model utility model means a, a specialized agency at the city level focusing on water and sewerage but in lusaka and others they have been transformed into water and sanitation they also take care of the on site sanitation not just sewerage but in japan it is predominantly municipality which regulates it and that's what he mentioned so all the models are good provided we have a good regulatory systems clear roles and responsibilities defined and accountability fixed it is not about one against the other different contexts have different things we may not have in many countries like in in pakistan in india in bangladesh it's predominantly municipality except big cities big cities have water and wastewater yeah. utilities their sewerage is also apart from sewerage sanitation is taken care of but in predominant in this region except african region utility concept is missing it's a municipality which drives it and in japan also municipal system is working so it's not about one against the other it's a question of good sanitation governance and good regulation and good operation and maintenance practices that he mentioned this is in summary this slide deck will be shared with you you will get on to the details and there are case studies which shanti has also shared it's all it's all about good policy and good regulation japan is a good example of regulation working well because of good systems and it is not very difficult we can replicate now i will stop here do we have any questions any any clarifications any doubts it doesn't matter you know sometimes we understand we may not understand if you have any doubts if you have any clarifications or any uh, you may also argue that it will work in japan but may not work in hyderabad you can argue you may say it is very expensive this jokaso system could be expensive once in four months of inspection is impossible in jharkhand <laughs> mr ashok kumar was laughing when i said you know they inspect once in four months <laughs> our stps are not inspected once in five years also it is running and running so frank over to you <laughs> I just want to make sure. Oh, it is a big bit of noise. Uh, background noise, Frank. 
Uh, yes, I want to make a comment. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, what you said is true that, uh, for example, uh, you can compare it to, to African countries, but in the case of Burkina Faso, we do not lack recognition. Frank, you know, we are unable to hear you. Sorry about it, Frank. Frank, Frank can you put it in the chat box? Okay, I will. Yes, Frank, we are, we are, uh, is it for me or for everyone? No, no, no. If there's a background noise. The background so sound is there, Frank. So, would you mind uh, uh, placing your question in the chat box, Frank? I'm sorry, uh, you know, we couldn't hear you. Apologies. Okay. So, uh, before Frank uh, uh, responds, any other comments? Uh, Mr. Madan Bahadur? Any any observations? Because Nepal is going through, uh, you know, process of strengthening citywide inclusive sanitation. Is this experience, uh, what we discussed about Japan experience, is it uh, relevant for you? How do we, what are the lessons we can learn? So there's a question by uh, uh, Ms. Nikita Rai, uh, Hashimoto-san. Yeah. Uh, every human resource are very well trained. How is it planned? Who's re who's a responsible body to train them? Will there be capacity assessment of these human resources involved? It's a very beautiful question she asked. Mm -hmm. So, would you like to respond, uh, Hajimoto san Okay. Yes. Uh, actually, the training institution. There is one uh, training institution. Uh, uh, called Japan Education Center for Environmental Sanitation, which was actually uh, founded quite uh, maybe uh, 50 years ago. And uh, uh, when Joe Act was promulgated in, that is 40 years ago, 19, 83, this law specifically says that the all the uh, workers, uh, technicians, who will be engaged in the uh, installation works and the maintenance inspection works and the desalting works needs to be trained by the uh, training institution designated by the central government. That is what the Japanese law, uh, Jokaso law said. And uh, these institutions, Japan Embar Education Center for Environmental Sanitation was designated by the central government at the time as the training institutions. And uh, uh, so everybody who works in the on-site sanitation job needs to be trained by these training institutions. And the training fee must be paid by the trainee himself. And uh, train uh, this people who want to have a job in related to on-site sanitation are willing, uh, are willing to pay the training fee because if once uh, he passed, uh, he finished complete the training course and passed the examination, his job is secure. That is the system uh, which uh, uh, Japan is uh, doing. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Hashimoto san, what he's saying is, uh, Nikita ji, there's a national training institute, environmental training institute. You can visualize something like that in uh, uh, Nepal. And then uh, Japan had a bit of equivalent of manual scavenging, as we said. And all of them got professionalized through these training programs. And then they go through a certification program and the jobs are assured. 
and they are reasonably well paying jobs because they go through this rigorous training program only certified professionals are given these jobs so i think uh, uh, dr sitaram would you like to add uh, anything on this point particular point so this is a very important point uh, which uh, i request professor chari to dwell on it because in most of developing countries particularly in south asia we have a taboo for these workers sanitary workers um, which japan has nicely uh, overcome by uh, solving this and converting them into licensed to professionals and this is a great achievement and it is actually the political leaders who championed this by bringing a regulation by also classifying them as licensed workers and also skilling them systematically which has been operating for over 50 years so it's worth a study to look at it systematically thank you thank you dr sitaram for reinforcing that point great point we will discuss this you know there is a separate session on training and capacity building unless and until we do that the quality of service and also the dignity of human life will be compromised so i think that's a point uh, uh, dr sitaram is talking the one or two questions uh, hashimoto san i'll uh, these are two questions we can ask who pays for jokaso inspectors is amount collected from tax is enough or government spends a lot on sanitation so are uh, who is paying to the inspection it's a household who is paying for the inspection yeah. right yes household yeah and what if they don't pay hmm? what if they don't pay because that is a that is a question bothers uh, mr ashok kumar hmm. so what if they uh, they don't pay the household are there any situations where uh, the inspector is not allowed to inspect because hmm. citizens have to pay are there such situations that hmm. one comes yes. across i mean i mean japanese are typically law abiding citizens and mm. we probably can't relate to it but uh, ot okay uh the household must pay the inspection fee and uh, if uh, uh, he household doesn't pay the inspection fee inspection is not conducted and in this case such a case will be reported to the uh, municipality and there will be warning letter from municipality uh, mayor to the this household So in Japan, if such happens, uh, everybody will respond. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer your question, Mr. Ashok Kumar, there are two aspects here. One is there could be a potential fine for uh, not complying with the law. Second is also it's a matter of shame. So it's a, you know like a, everybody pays the property tax, but if one household doesn't pay, there could be a shaming. So in Japanese culture, if somebody is not following the law. it is often considered as a a shameful activity which uh, may be uh, may not be very very common for us but i think that's a cultural aspect if i if i allowed yeah. sir my question was uh, a bit different uh, i asked about uh, is uh, amount collected by inspectors is enough uh, as a salary as it is uh, uh, collected so hashimoto the, the, the question is also 10 to 50 is household enough? about 30 households yeah is the payment sufficient enough for the inspection or is the city government subsidizing it uh, no subsidy no subsidy uh, as far as operation and maintenance is concerned there will be no subsidy from any, anybody um, uh, i i would add that in for the capex of jokaso there is a subsidy system Subsidies are available for not a full amount, but maybe forty percent of Jokaso capex will be subsidized by local central as well as local government. But uh, for operation and maintenance, uh, absolutely no subsidy. So, Mr. Ashok, you are exactly following the same. We may not re- relate to it, but uh, as government of Jharkhand, you provide subsidy to the household for capex. and for periodic desludging whatever o n m the citizens are paying for it am i right but there is no inspection there is no other things but typically uh, the capex is subsidized to some extent even in the case of J- J- jokasu it's i was asking as uh, their inspection is going three to four times in a year so there may right. be 
large number of human resource will be in, involved there and uh, that uh, human resource uh, is getting payment from only from household as they inspect as uh, stated by hashimoto sir so that was i was asking if a person inspects like uh, in a month 60 to 70 houses so it will be is it enough for that person to uh, as a, a remuneration or yeah. government uh, give some uh, amount to inspectors like uh, some amount in addition to that uh, collected from the households mm. yeah okay the uh, uh, what is happening in uh, japan is that you see the well skilled is uh, maintenance operator operator uh, skilled operator can inspect more than 10 uh, houses per day so and uh, they will collect uh, from each household maybe one inspection they collect maybe uh 40 dollars power inspection and the people pay and uh, so japan is uh relatively uh, uh what shall i say there is no so much income disparities so it works the system works in japan but uh, in developing countries there is an income disparity, huge income disparity. So therefore, I consider that even the on-site sanitation system, management of on-site sanitation system, in developing countries, cross-subsidization is necessary. So therefore, how to create such a system in which cross-subsidization from rich people or commercial customers to residential customers, including poor, uh, poor customers. How uh, can we structure such a system? It's uh, essential for developing countries. That's why, as far as organization framework and the financial framework, I don't think Japanese model is not the best model. <laughs> so therefore, other models like uh, utility uh, model uh, should also be considered. So uh, for friends, uh, we will discuss this later when we have case study of Hyderabad. Uh, the city of Hyderabad in India, uh, they used, a, it's a utility, Hyderabad Water Board. Uh, what they have done is to have a, a cross subsidization model where the desludging charges for the commercial establishments are priced at a higher level. For high-rise high residential, it is priced moderately, slightly more than the cost. And for the low-income communities, if a private operator goes for desludging of low-income communities, there is a cross-subsidization from the commercial as well as from industrial and high-rise residential to uh, uh, slum areas. So there are cross-subsidization models available. Josna, if you can share the Hyderabad experience of cross subsidization model, uh, I think it will be useful to some of our participants. Sure. We sir. can, we can like the way water is cross subsidized. You charge more for high income communities and industrial and commercial areas and cross subsidized slum areas. Similarly, for septage management and other related issues, we can also structure cross subsidization model. There are examples. This last question, Hashimoto san which is our friend uh, from Africa, Frank, tried to ask you. Now, he says that uh, uh, regulations about sanitation are available in most, uh, in many African countries, uh, but these regulations are not correctly applied or compromised. I'm adding the word compromised. He has not said, but it is not effectively implemented, which is true. So what is your advice? How do you make, and even uh, I would request uh, uh, Dr. Sitaram also, uh, is there any mechanism for enhancing the accountability of these regulations, making it transparent and engaging civil society groups? How do you make these regulations, which are good regulations, but often is, are not working on the ground? Any thoughts? Mm. So, 
So I I cannot maybe I cannot to uh, answer fully to your uh, questions, but uh, one training of uh, operators or such a workers is uh, one way. Why? You see, in, in Japan, say the training course for the operator will usually take two weeks. And uh, half of this training is done on the regressions. So the operator needs to know the regression. The, the, if he knows very well, uh, he knows very well about the regressions, when he en en meet with the customers, uh, maybe uh, he can tell the customer what is the regression and persuade him to do to follow the regressions. And the operator himself needs to follow the regressions. So for that purpose, training is very important. Any uh, comments, uh, Dr. Sitaram, on uh, enhancing accountability? How do we make these regulations work effectively? So um, this has been a debate. Uh, in this course, we are uh, all kind of uh, already committed to sanitation. So maybe we are like kind of lecturing to the choir. But <laughs> the examples that I shared from the Philippines, Duma Gete, and also the example that uh, Hashimoto a Sons has shared like Metro Manila's Manila water. These are very important examples to dwell deeply on. Even in many of our uh, countries where we have not uh, really raised the level of accountability for sanitation, like in Japan, we have done in other sectors. For example, everybody is getting a cable TV connection in your house and you're paying for it. And uh, somebody is coming and checking. You have 24 by seven call center service. If you have a problem, somebody even physically will visit you. We're giving an appointment. All this you have now started enjoying and you're paying for all of that. So sanitation can and should become like that. And this is what Japan's example and experience is. However, we have kind of not realized its value. This is another important thing from the Dumagate example. That is. It's not how much you pay, it is do you value it? You know, uh, in, a, in the case of a cable TV, if a cricket match is going on or a, some great show is going on, if a disconnection comes, you will not be happy. You will call and you will want it to be connected. So we, we know its value, right? And we pay for it. The same thing will come and should come for sanitation. That is where he shared the history. When Japan was not as rich, they prioritize sanitation because they really understood the savings of life, good health. We also deserve that in our countries and you are the agents of challenge. If people deserve entertainment in their homes to watch cable TV, why not proper sanitation? And why not pay for it? These are the kind of communication we should do to make it work like a business. How much to pay, how to make them pay, as Kashimoto's answered, you may create your own mechanism, but we should make it work like that. And that's where we should make some baby steps, some incremental steps to go towards it, but not to accept defeat uh, very early. So I'm hoping that we will innovate these kind of new mechanisms, use of technology to monitor, to check, to inform, to share knowledge, all of the above. And I hope that we will have a positive ladder and hopefully a steep ladder uh, towards it. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Sitaram. Uh, so so uh, friends, you know, uh, one such example what Dr. Sitaram mentioned is about communication. We have a similar problem in one of our towns called Warangal and some of you visited or you would be visiting where uh, the regulation says that every household has to de-sludge periodically once in three years. Now this has not been done. So what we did was to engage civil society and communicate to them the, the benefits of periodic desludging. And mind you, this is through civil society organizations. I was also present, some of our team members were doing. And we were uh, surprised to inform you, Frank, that civil society organizations by themselves now created a platform, a sanitation platform, and they have 
surprisingly taken a voluntary effort to desludge immediately through this communication process. I'm just giving you one example that if we can bridge the communication and convey what is this regulation and what is the payoff of this regulation, we can make some baby steps towards improvement. And that's what I think the experience of Japan, the experience of Dumagate, what uh, Dr. Chitra mentioned, we shall not accept defeat. We shall make so those steps, even if they are incremental improvements, but move towards, I think, uh, a better sanitation outcomes. And I think uh, both these examples have amplified that sanitation pays off, both from health point of view, as well as from economic, local economic development point of view. I think with this, uh, I thank uh, Dr. Chitra, Shanti, and uh, Ashimoto san for taking out this time and uh, sharing these experiences. And I encourage all of you to share these videos with your political bosses, with your bureaucrats, with your IS officers or any other officers that you are dealing with them. Just forward them these videos and I'm sure there will be some political mileage may come out of this process. Thank you very much and have a great evening or great morning wherever, in whichever geography you are in.